So I said a couple weeks ago that we're going to do three weeks, right? Uh, three weeks on sort of living the resurrection. And I don't think I mentioned the terms living the resurrection last week. So if you're going to do a three-part series, you probably want to at least mention the second part once. But the idea was caring for the earth um, is, is an aspect of living the resurrection. The previous week, um, right, living the resurrection tells us uh, the story that we need to, to share out. But finally, living the resurrection um, t- compels us to understand that the ends of the earth start here. So we heard a story read for, from Acts 8, a quite famous story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And it's one that I think we've heard lots, and, and this idea and this, this almost supernatural guiding of Philip to, to the, the a high official within the Ethiopian government. And how it's sort of this next big step in acts of going forward and forward. So what, what I want to do today is I want to use that, that Acts 8 passage sort of as the middle ground to launch through this idea of the ends of the earth start here. First, I, we're going to unpack a little bit of the, the structure of Acts, the idea that um, Acts has a progression. It's going somewhere. Uh, Luke, in writing it, has, um, has a goal of getting Paul to Rome, and that's how Acts ends, with, with Paul in Rome. And there's progressions that get there. Second, we will talk about um, Philip and the eunuch himself um, and sort of who Philip is. Third, we will jump from Philip 100, then 200 years later to the early church. And then finally, we will conclude with what the local impetus for us is based upon that. I was, um, as we were just uh, giving Andre the sort of so the idea so what he could go with music-wise on, on Thursday, I said, yeah, so we'll go through the structure of Acts. He's like, oh, you're preaching through the entire books of Acts in one Sunday. I was like, no, I'm even going to the early church too. So not only are we going to do the entire book of Acts, we're going to do all of the early church in one Sunday. Then we're going to have a town hall. (laughs) So first, let's start with a little bit of the structure of Acts. If you looked at Acts 1.8, it talks about how Jesus, um, just before his ascension, um, lays this out to them. He repl- they ask him the question. They say, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, um, Acts 1, 6, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? But Jesus replied, verse 7, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This seems to be for, for Luke in act, uh, um, a structural breakdown. This is how the, pa- the, the book will unpack. And if you look through Acts, there's a bunch of markers of this progress. Acts 6-7 goes, So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. So it's sort of th- to Jerusalem. Then 9.31, Acts 9.31 says, The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord, and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. So we've got this progress, stories of, of what happened in Jerusalem, stories of what are happening in Galilee and Samaria, and then, and then it continues... Um, 1224, meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. Then 16.5, so the, church, so the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. 9.20, so the message about the Lord spread wildly and had a powerful effect. And then finally, 28, verse 30 and 31. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaimed the kingdom of God and the teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. So we've got these, these progress reports, un- unpacking acts. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. It seems like a uh, common expression for Rome back then was the ends of the earth. The idea that the Roman Empire was as, fall, as far as big as they could imagine the earth so it's the idea, once Paul gets to Rome, as, as sort of the, the Roman Empire knows, it's sort of the ends of the earth. But there's also this part where the book of Acts is unfinished. 
It's sort of why there's a church planting organization called Acts 29 Network, because there's no 29th chapter of Acts. Sort of, we are the 29th chapter of Acts, that sort of idea. I'm sure that's a, a fairly common um, belief. I think there's, a, so there's different organizations in the past too. But that idea, so, so this is the structure. So in the midst of this, we have one specific example, a specific character who comes ac- onto the scene, and that's Philip. We don't know much about Philip. We don't have a lot about him. He first appears um, in Acts 6.1, and if you remember that, that story, it's when um, the, the Jewish and the Hellenist uh, widows were, the food was being distributed, and it seemed like the, the Jerusalem resident, the, the Ju- Jerusalem widows were getting the bread first, and the Hellenistic ones were being, were being forgotten, um, whether it was intentional, whether it was just someone was focusing on, on the ones they knew, so they, they, they brought it up and the disciples discerned and they decided that they would appoint specific people to participate in that. Stephen was one of them and Philip also. Their, their role was to participate as servants, as deacons in spreading the, the bread. Ensuring that the widows were taken care of. Then obviously we know what happened. We have Stephen's story and the sort of the launch of persecution where Stephen is stoned. Um, for, for proclaiming the good news, um, for challenging the Jerusalem um, Jewish leadership. And through that, the church actually spread. It was, it's an interesting aspect because the church seemed to almost be a little too comfortable in, in and around Jerusalem that the persecution that arose because of Stephen launched them and caused people to start going outside. So Philip is one who was, who was launched into mission. He was sent. And the story that, uh, that, that Nathan read for us picks that up. First, he had uh, the interaction in uh, chapter 8, verse 4 and following with, the, with a, a magician named Simon. Right? And, and they had, uh, he took through, um, sorry, trying to speak out loud here. Through the interactions with him, Simon tried to, to actually bri- bribe and get the Holy Spirit's power. And that's why we use the term simony for someone who tries to use finances to buy a priestly office. But there's this interaction with this magician and, and loss of finances. And then the, the disciples come from Jerusalem and they look and see what's going on in Samaria. And they say, in essence, the same spirit as work is at work here as was at work in Jerusalem. And they pray and the spirit descends the continuation of the Spirit going forward. And that's why I actually started the, the reading one verse earlier than what it is. It's the, the, the Philip passage starts in verse 26, but at, at verse 25 concludes this section. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, and they stopped in many Samaritan villages along the way to preach the good news. So the Gospels reached Samaria. So now we have Philip and his specific encounter. So verse 26, as, Philip, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south, which could also mean go, uh, go at noon, um, uh, down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out there and met the treasurer of Ethiopia. The angel of the Lord said to him, go south. A couple verses later, in verse 29, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. It's sort of interesting. Is it the angel of the Lord? Is it the Spirit? Are they synonymous? But it's just this interesting sort of Old Testament um, use, um, angel of the Lord, and versus almost this more New Testament understanding. Not that they're, they're different, but they're recounting. And this makes us think of, of Elijah in, in Second Kings, the idea where go here, go here, go here. But, so the spirit directs him to the Ethiopian eunuch. Right? The spirit creates this, this space, this opportunity, and he goes, and he stands there. The Ethiopian eunuch's reading this passage of Isaiah, obviously out loud. Reads it, and he's like, who's he talking about? Himself or somebody else? But before he got to that, it was the, idea, the, the question was raised, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? 
And the Ethiopian eunuch responds, how can I know unless someone tells me, unless someone teaches me? We've got this, this guy who has some sort of, for lack of a better term, spiritual background and understanding, who's trying to read this but cannot understand it. It hasn't been explained to him. He hasn't heard the story in fully, we'll say. I think about our society. Yeah, a couple weeks ago, there was an editorial in the Winnipeg Free Press that talked about um, the loss of biblical literacy and how important it is, not from a, not even from a Christian perspective, but from trying to communicate in society. Um, even previously, there was a, the New York Times was reviewing some poetry, and someone used the expression "through the eye of a needle." And then he's like, "That's that's," and the, the reviewer said, "That's violent imagery," as if you're trying to stab someone th- through the eye of a needle. But if we think of it from a from a biblical perspective, right, trying to get camel through the eye of a needle is, is impossible. So if you have this, this sort of this biblical literacy understanding, you understand. It's, uh, the point of that is, in our society, the story isn't necessarily known anymore. There is no framework. There might be some, there might be some sort of understanding, but they don't know. The world does not know. There was a time when you could assume a fair bit of a foundation that you would be talking and people would understand. But more and more, it's not. Even a couple we- within the last couple of weeks, I cannot remember which, which magazine it was, um, one, of the, one of the popular ones, um, either Vogue, GQ, or, or Vanity Fair in that style, who said, here are 10 or 20 books that you don't need to read anymore, and here are 20, 10 or 20 that you should read instead the 10th or 12th on the list was the Bible. You don't need to read this anymore. About 15 years ago, Richard Dawkins wrote a, wrote a paper. Amongst other things, he actually said it's important to understand the Bible because you can't understand Shakespeare if you don't understand the Bible. You can't understand our society if you're not biblically literate. So, so Philip talks to this Ethiopian eunuch and he says, let me help you with your Old Testament literacy. And we don't hear, have exactly what he said. But we have this idea that he, he answered the question he needed. He explained in light of the story that he had been told. The story of the Messiah. The story of the one who had to s- who suffered. The one who was led like a sheep. He seemed to explain in so much detail that as they kept going further, the eunuch saw water and said, hey, why don't you baptize me? Why don't you, why don't I take that step? Then after that, Philip is gone and we know nothing. We know nothing more about this event. So and let's recap what Philip, Philip's interaction with the, the Ethiopian eunuch First, it was spirit-directed. The spirit created the space, and Philip went willingly. Two, he found that space, and he was able to answer a question. There was a need that the eunuch had, a need need that the eunuch brought to him, in essence. And he offered something. He offered the story. He was able to answer that question. Hold on to that. I want to jump a couple, a couple uh, between 100 and then 200 years later. The story continues to spread. Paul gets to Rome. Um, systematically, Rome becomes more Christian. It takes a while. It's bubbling under the surface. In the early church, um, it's, it, the early church, how they grew is sort of a fascinating sociological project for for many sociologists because this question of how this almost insignificant from a sociological perspective small group of people became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire in about 250 300 years 
like with like not even from a from a theological perspective where we think we, we there's various answers we have that is a fascinating question how did that happen there's two specific instances i want to show that connect with this they both um revolve around plagues obviously in ancient cities if a plague happened it could wipe out a population quite quickly there was a massive plague in around 165 to 180 um, AD or CE, depending on how you want to date, um, where according about a quarter to a third of the population w- were killed, uh, including uh, Marcus Aurelius. Um, so we have this, this plague. Um, historians suggest it might have been smallpox, but we're talking significant amounts of the population there was a famous Roman doctor at that time. His name was Gallen. And you know what he did when the plague came? He hightailed it out of town and hid <laughs> until it was gone. So if you lo- look at it and say, how were the responses to this I- event? And there's sort of three main gr- groups of people in Rome at this time. Um, nowhere near equal numbers. There would be sort of the animistic pagans, the general run-of-the-mill pagans, which would have been the vast majority of the population. But, but pagans and their priests, their priests would have ran out of the city too because they would have been the elites. They would have had the financial power. So the, the, the flock, as it were, you don't question the, the pagan gods. You don't try to understand what they do. They have no concept of, of love. You, you, they do what they do and it doesn't matter. So they don't have an answer for the question. The second group would be the philosophers. And their pretty much answer is, like, we don't have any idea. This is a natural thing. This is, this, is not, uh, this is not something we can understand. It's beyond them. So if you're a, a Roman citizen trying to wonder why half your family died in a plague, two of the three options don't make sense. The third option is this small group of Christians who have a God who they believe loves them, a God who does love them, a God who's actively involved. And you know what? Because they're constantly in the state of suffering. They have a theology of suffering and understanding that, that death isn't the end, that there's more. But even in the midst of this, because of that lack of fear of death, while the famous doctors and, and uh, pagan priests were fleeing from the city, the crazy Christians were fleeing back into the city. Because in, in instances like, like um, plagues, basic nursing increases your chance of survival. Just, just basic clean. Burying your dead with respect decreases the chance that the, that the plague could spread. So because of that, the survival rate amongst Christian households were higher. And because people were recovering from the plague, they were immune to the plague, so then they could walk amongst the bodies. Through the midst of this, many of the pagans looked and saw, first of all, this Christian God seems to have some sort of power and two, these Christians seem to be different. What about them is different? So in the midst of that, the church grew fairly well. Why? In essence, led by the Spirit, they found the space that was created and they offered something. Basic nursing. Basic care. Similar things happened about 100 years later with another plague. The first one they thought was smallpox. This one, they, they, the guess is that it was measles. So um, approximately 5,000 people per day died. A Cyprian, who was a bishop of Carthage at this time, said something in essence of, um, if only this plague was like the Exodus, where the firstborn son was taken. But I don't know many households with only one person who were affected. But he also continues this letter to talk about how his par- parishioners had been actively participating in the same way as they had approximately 100 years ago. Through these plagues, the Christian church offered something. Hope, life, nursing, death with, with a certain amount of dignity, burying, all these things. Even more fascinating is about, uh, about 70 years later, um, after Constantine, there was another emperor named Julian the Apostate. Julian sent a letter saying, hey guys, let's be more charitable like the Christians because they're making us look foolish. 
So we have this We have this idea. I'm going to quote, uh, most of the stuff is relying on a sociologist named Rodney Stark, but this is a quote that he has. Pagans and Christian writers are unanimous that not only did Christian scripture stress love and charity as the central duties of faith, but that these were sustained in everyday behavior. Lucian wrote of the Christians, their original lawgiver taught them that they were all brethren, one of the other. Uh, I suggest reading the following passage from Matthew 25, 35 to 40, as if for the very first time in order to gain insight into the power of the, this new mort- morality when it was new, not centuries later, when in more cynical and worldly times. What's fascinating about Stark is that he initially came at this from a sociological perspective, and then through this process he understood that this God is alive, and he came to faith through it. So, we see, we see how Philip approached the eunuch. We see how the early church approached sort of the community around them. The question then is, what about us? Like, how do we, this idea is the ends of the earth starts here. It's fascinating because, as I mentioned, as biblical literacy is dropped in our society, so are people who, are, who are call themselves Christians in our nation, around the world. The, the church is, is dying a little bit in the West. It's flourishing in, in various other places, but it's dying in, what, in, in the West. We don't necessarily any longer need to send missionaries far across the seas to find people who have never heard the story. We just need to walk down our streets. The world has changed in that way, that, that drastically different story. So what do we do? In the past, in, in the days of Julian the Apostate, in the days of the early church, we were being charitable and donating uh, philanthrop- philanthropically was, was unexpected, it's no longer necessarily the case nowadays. How often do we hear of famous business people who d- donate lots of money? And no longer can we just be, I'm just going to be a regular good North American neighbor. There's, um, according to, to teaching methods, if you say what people expect you to say, you don't get much of a response. But if you say something that is unexpected, you're more likely to get a response. Take that from a mission perspective. If you tell the people what they expect to hear or do what they expect you to do, you're not going to get a response. But if you do something unexpected, like, like running back into a plague, like when people didn't give money, giving money. So I think the challenge for us is twofold. One, we need to follow the same pattern of Philip, the same pattern of the other church. We need to be open to the Spirit's leaning and find that space that the Spirit is creating in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Two, as we enter that space with humility, we must be able to answer questions. Create opportunity for a question to be asked. Shock them. Not in a, in a way of intentionally trying to shock them with that, but give them something that is unexpected. Surprise them. And finally, really, have something to offer. Whether it's nursing whether it's hope, whether it's this, or ultimately, the story of Jesus. We constantly hear about those, those suffering. We constantly hear about death. How much more is a story that says death is meaningless? Death is defeated. And finally, I say twofold, the third part is this needs to be unexpected. It can't be the same old thing. There needs to be something new. I'm not talking changing the message. I'm not talking yeah, I'm not talking throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But let's not do the same old thing. Because the ends of the earth, really, they, they do start here. That doesn't mean we forget about 
missions work around the world. But it means that we are missionaries in our community. That's the nature of things now. I remember hearing um, uh, someone talk about it, about how, and this is probably 20 years ago, how soon um, Asia and Africa will be sending missionaries to Canada, to the United States. And maybe then, when, when a devout Korean Christian comes knocking on our door and says, can I tell you about my Jesus? Maybe then people will start he- hearing it differently. But this is where we live. This is our home. This is our community. This is where we are somewhere or another have been called to. So the challenge is, the ends of the earth start right here. And how do we go about and do that? That's something that we're going to be talking through over the next little while. But I believe that these three principles of allowing the Spirit to direct us, being there and creating that space and being filling that space and being able to answer a question and offer something is a good approach. This is the final thought I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with. The same guy who looked at uh, Stark, the same guy who looked at um, early Christianity, looked at how uh, the, the Mormon, the LDS church grew, and the Moonies grew in North America, um, tried to understand how, did, how were they effective because they do have a very effective conversion rate. Um, uh, per capita. Their, their responses for knocking on your door was about one in a thousand. One in a thousand, so every thousand door knocks, maybe one person will respond. The numbers skyrocketed when they got in your living room. When they're sitting on your couch talking to you, the, f- the first Mooney missionary um, um, in, in San Francisco area, most of her converts were, were other women that she hung out with. There's something about community, being together, that creates space for this. That is a challenge for, for all of us. So I want to leave you with the idea that, right, the ends of the earth start here. If we want to live the resurrection, we have to live as missionaries in Winnipeg, in Manitoba, depending on, on where we specifically live. Let's pray. God, we thank you that... Uh, that you sent your spirit to empower us so that we can be your witnesses. And God, I pray you'll teach us how to be your witnesses, really, either on, on Willow Lake Drive or at our, our community home. And then in Winnipeg and Manitoba, through Canada, throughout the world, as we participate in what you're doing. We thank you that, that you are at work and that we get to participate in that. Teach us how, show us. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.